Hello, this is a little pre-video ramble, recorded after I made the rest of it, because I didn't realize when making this quite how widely loved Fear and Hunger is. It's definitely one of the most universally praised games in the indie horror market I've ever seen. And that's exactly why I'm making this disclaimer, because I didn't like it. People recommended it to me, I think expecting me to like it. A lot of my friends love it. The internet as a whole seems to revere this game. And I, yeah, I didn't like it. I outline my reasons as to why, and I think they're valid. But I also understand not everything's for everyone. If this is your thing, that's great. I know there's some great communities based around this game. And yeah, I hold no ill will towards people who like the game. I just have my own particular reasons as to not. So yeah, I'm very much putting this disclaimer here to be like, hey, don't freak out, but um, I'm someone who loves horror media, dark media, bleak media, all things like that. And Fear and Hunger did not do it for me. So if that's not something you want to hear, fair play, but otherwise, enjoy. For years now, one game in particular has been recommended to me time and time again. From mentions of it being Lovecraftian to it being horrifically bleak and semi-obscure, it ticks a lot of my boxes. But for the longest time, I've avoided it. It's become this strange icon of weird internet horror games that I, by all means, should have already looked at. Yet, something kept me away from it. Something that's hard to put into words. I don't care for RPG Maker games. That's why. Never mind, it was actually very easy to articulate that. I know that kind of kills the ominous vibe, but I really just do not care for the format. But that doesn't change the fact that this game is widely known for being one of the most difficult, disturbing, and bleak games to ever break into the indie horror market. Recently, I've seen it make the rounds on TikTok and the like, often mentioned alongside other games like Sad Satan and Hatred, so I figured now would be an excellent time to finally get around to it. And by now, I mean November of last year, which is when I bought and played it for the first time, but what is November if not the now of the past? Another reason it's taken me some time to make a video on it is due to the somewhat unfortunate RNG I encountered on my first playthrough. For those who are unaware, when you start the game, you have a chance of being afflicted with a specific phobia, which will affect your character greatly when you're exposed to whatever you're afraid of. My first character rolled panophobia. In other words, the fear of everything, which admittedly took some of the wind out of my sails, but now I'm starting fresh, ready to experience whatever is thrown at me. So join me in my journey into the dreaded halls, shaded tombs, vast caverns, and the all too knowable, and completely unknowable horrors of fear and hunger. Now, before I start, I will say, this is probably the first time I've come close to finishing a video before realizing someone else has already made a very similar video that is not only longer than mine, but also covers more. That being Zuldim's Fear and Hunger, an in-depth look at the RPG that hates you, which is an excellent video that I wholeheartedly recommend. We have a few similar talking points that I promise I did not steal, and some eerily similar comparisons, which genuinely made me feel nauseous when I found the video because I thought I'd unknowingly plagiarized everything I've ever made, but we do come to some quite different conclusions on things, and his video is more comprehensive and mechanically focused, whereas this is more about my specific experience and journey through the game, so there will be some spoilers. I'm not smart enough to talk about mechanics like other people, I exclusively deal in vibes. Anyway, let's get to it. At the start, I was given the option of multiple difficulties, and I have absolutely no qualms picking the easiest one. If this game's reputation is anything to go by, and if my previous attempt at playing is to be considered, I'd say that this game's easiest is most other games fucked. Naturally, I picked a barbarian looking guy, and I call him John Hammer. In the intro, you get to choose some character options. I picked an axe over a bow, naturally. I politely declined to eat other humans, and then I got terrified by the existence of Canada. Naturally, I take a souvenir anyway. I get told that everyone I know and love is dead, and I'm also told that this is not a good thing. I decide to follow the fellows that killed them, and they're already in jail. Apparently, I do not trust the judicial system, and decide to pursue them into prison. Strange. At least I brought my three carrots. As I've played the game's intro before, I know that a group of wolves are about to come and annihilate me, so I decide to gather some more carrots and then head inside. This is when I decide to pause the game and check if I've developed any kind of phobia. Rabdophobia. The fear of magic. Absolutely perfect. Though, in my head, John Hammer's raptophobia is more of an intolerance to magic rather than a fear. He, he's a mage denier. 
Oh, unrelated, but I also beat a dead horse for no apparent reason. In our initial exploration, we get to see a lot of the game's art style and general visual language. It's grimy, fleshy, rotten, and I imagine everything would feel like it's coated in varying thicknesses of some unknown, cold and viscous slime. It's cool. Not to sound too much like gamer who has only played Amnesia, but I'm getting an Amnesia vibe from it. It's visually similar to The Dark Descent in some ways, if not much more grisly and more horribly organic. It gives an incredibly strong visual impression, and it's very consistent throughout the entire experience, even if later areas deviate from that grossness and become more otherworldly. I find a friend. He's quite a sweet fellow, really. I think I'll call him Bob. Moments later, Bob is dismembered by John Hammer. I get injected with something. Does the game tell me what this little symbol means? Of course not. Why would it? It doesn't tell you many things, like what foods are likely to heal you and which ones are not. From what I can gather, it's the blue foods that are good. Naturally, while walking around, I get sucked into a void where someone runs circles around me and giggles. They let me leave peacefully after I loot their pocket dimension. Seeing as this is a prison, I'm going to assume that was solitary confinement? With a spooky friend? I meet John Tutorial and he tells me how to play the game, and by that he says, I think you'll be alright, and then he threatens to kill me. He also mentions the basics of the game's combat, but it's the other stuff that really stuck out. I then find myself in an actual prison where I come across Fear and Hunger's most infuriating enemy. A singular nail. These bastards have probably ruined thousands of collective days across everyone who has played this game's playtime. If you step on it, you start bleeding and sometimes get an infection. In most other games, that's not a big deal, but in this one, everything is a big deal. This is where one of Fear and Hunger's biggest elements really becomes obvious. In a lot of difficult games, you'll find the term hard but fair or something similar passed around. That phrase doesn't mean anything. People only use that for difficult things that they like, and difficult things they dislike will have artificial difficulty, but who's to say what's fair and what's artificial? Bear with me a moment. In most strategy games, Age of Empires, Civilization, Europa Universalis, whatever you're into, AI opponents will often be given absurd bonuses, modifiers, additional mechanics, whatever they can get to up their abilities versus the player. And this is largely absolutely fine. Few people complain about this, but this is objectively artificial difficulty. They're just getting flat, objective, and unfair advantages over the player. And again, that's good. People like it for the most part. It works. Then we look at the Souls games. All of the Souls games get the hard but fair treatment from fans constantly, until there's a boss they dislike. The Valiant Gargoyles, the Godskin Duo, the Crucible Knights, any number of random duo or trio fights from Elden Ring are all widely despised, including by me. I do not like these fights, but people will use phrases like unfair or bullshit when describing them, and I've certainly done that in the past. But they're not unfair. Because what the hell does fair mean in that context? FromSelf don't deceive you or hide shit from you in those fights? They don't pull a fast one on you or break their own rules? They're objectively hard but fair. But you won't catch people saying that about them because these bosses are hated. There's nothing artificially difficult about them unless you view the entire concept of boss fights as being artificially difficult because they get tons of stuff you don't. In which case, most games ever are artificially difficult. I feel like people have this need when discussing any kind of media to use buzzwords or technical terms just to be taken seriously or contribute meaningfully to a conversation, but you don't need to do that. Those fights in Elden Ring are not unfair. They're not bullshit. They're just shit. They're not fun, and that's their biggest crime. But that entire tangent was relevant to Fear and Hunger, I promise. Because now that we've established that fair difficulty and artificial difficulty are kind of strange terms, we can discuss what kind of difficulty fear and hunger has. And I can best describe it with one word. Cruel. Fuck, there's not a single unique thing I can say about this game. When I mean cruel, let's take this combat encounter, for example. I start fighting this prison guard, cut off his hand and his... enormous penis, and then attempt to cut off his other hand. I fail to do so before he charges at me. So far, everything's fine, I have no notes about this. But then I'm given the choice of heads or tails. A coin flip, a common mechanic in this game which is a whole can of worms in itself, and I fail it. Keep in mind that this is the second enemy I have fought in this game, and it's one that you're meant to be able to kill this early on. It takes half of my health instantly, and kills me. So now we know that we have the random chance to get absolutely obliterated by enemies and forced to reload a save. Whatever, I knew it was a notoriously hard game, so I'm not holding anything against it. But when I die, 
I respawn somewhere else, with my legs cut off. You can lose limbs in this game, and it happens relatively often, and it's about as debilitating as it sounds, gameplay-wise. So now I'm given a choice. Attempt to beat the entirety of the remaining game, of which there is a lot left, with no legs, or give in and reload a save. There are ways in the game to regain limbs, but I didn't know this at the time, and chances are, neither did the rest of the players this happened to. Do you think the game developer had any intentions for you to continue the game like this? Of course not. The developer wanted you to give up. This is one of the only games I've ever played that actively punishes the player for playing it. It wants you to give in. It loves when you fail. It is unbelievably cruel. Now, thematically, that's incredible. I love it. But I'll talk more on that later. For now, I reload a save. The same thing happens to me again, though this time it's on me for drinking a parasite cure that replaces your parasite with a horrible poison. Naturally. Let's try again. And again, good heavens. I decide that I'm sick of looting this entire room again and again every single time I die, so I decide to loot all of it and then save again. I fail the coin flip to save the game. Yes, that's right. It's a fucking coin flip whether you can save the game or not. So, as a punishment for something that's almost entirely out of my control, Dollar Store Pyramid Head spawns in my room, complete with an ominous siren, and annihilates me. Are we having fun yet? Holy shit, we're in England. This explains a lot. I eventually figure out, thanks to a friend, that some enemies have a specific attack pattern that you can manipulate to beat them more consistently. That's pretty par for the course, but learning enemy attack patterns in a turn-based game that kills you for small errors and doesn't like you saving is a little time-consuming. Anyway, I find a friend! Finally! We can start turning the action economy in our favor and win more fights. Thank God. He stole my money and ran away. Now I'm all alone in a torture dungeon. I wonder who runs this place. Torture. Torture does, naturally. I rip him limb from limb, as is tradition in England. Following this, I find another prison guard, cut off his arms. I go for the head and miss. He hits me. I then go for his head. I miss. He hits me. I try to flee. The floor gives out underneath me. I flip a coin to see if I can dodge the falling ground. I fail. I eventually find a real friend. It's a child called Girl, and she's afraid of monsters. With this combination of fears, if we find a gnome, we're fucked. We find a magic scroll, which can give you an item of your choice. I have no idea what items are in the game. All I know is I have to type, Oh Lord, give, and then a thing. How about... Hammer. Shit. I stumble across a ritual circle, and I'm given a few options. Sacrifice, pray, or show love. Why don't we show love? That sounds nice. Oh god. So... Okay. Uh, let's talk about the enormous penis in the room. Part of this game's notoriety comes from its use of sexual content, and I'll warn you now, it's not nice sexual content. I really don't know why people are so quick to sort of ignore this aspect of the game when praising it. Listen, I'm fine with games having sexual content. I don't really give a shit about nudity or sex, that's just a part of life like anything else. But sexual violence and necrophilia and implied child exploitation? I'm less open to these things. Ultra-dark concepts have a place in fiction, and I firmly believe that. But if you're going to use them, you've got to have an excellent reason, otherwise you end up simply making shock content, and that's one of the lowest forms of media out there. There are a few enemies in particular that, upon defeating you, brutally assault you. Granted, it's in very low resolution and in a fairly tame art style, all things considered, but you're still shown it. Couple things like that with the huge number of enemies with not only weaponized, but actively targetable genitalia that you can, and are often encouraged to, mutilate, I start to ask questions. Mainly, why? I understand that this is meant to be an incredibly bleak game, but that's pretty fucking clear from, I don't know, every other aspect of the game? From what I can tell, the only reason this exists is to shock people. It's to elicit a reaction. Now, I know some people will say, oh, but you don't have any issue with dismembering people and having them dismember you and whatever else. Why is this not okay? To some of you, the idea of that opinion existing is insane, but trust me, it's unfortunately a lot more common than you'd think. People fail to realize that ultra-violence and absurd gore is so far removed from, sadly not all, but most of our lives. That other stuff is not. Sexual trauma is incredibly abundant. So much more so than a lot of people realize. 
Sorry to bring the mood down so tremendously, but it's the truth. Which is why, if you're going to use it in your media, you better have a fucking spectacular reason. Otherwise, you're just preying on real trauma for what? The honor of being called one of the internet's darkest games? Y you could have had that anyway. I know some people will claim that the assault is meant to represent the brutality of the Dungeons of Fear and Hunger, but I think the violence and torture and flaying and meat tunnels and the rest of the assorted dehumanization kinda covers that already. Others will say it represents a loss of innocence for the characters, but of the characters we play as, one is a Viking-style berserker who has seen atrocities and potentially engaged in cannibalism, one is a mercenary who's done all sorts of shit and steals from you if you meet him, and another one is basically described as being evil anyway. Only one seems to have any innocence to lose, and of course, that's how she's introduced to you if you're not playing as her, at least in implication. But she seems kind of fine afterwards, skimming over the whole idea and going back to a weirdly naive way of thinking, so the loss of innocence thing doesn't really track either. I've heard people say that it's alright because of the overall tonal abhorrence, but ask yourself this. If you removed the sexual assault from the game, would it change in any meaningful way? Keep the sex, keep the nudity, that's all fine. Hell, even keep the dick severing if you must. But I guarantee that without the explicit assault, we definitely draw some grim conclusions from the enemy designs and tone of the world anyway. But the game chooses to explicitly show it. Now, I wrote this whole tangent very early on in the scripting process, before I'd actually played much of the game, so who knows, maybe they do have a good reason to use it here. Let's find out. I find some more empty scrolls and decide to effectively cheat my way into good items because fuck this game, kindly. Plus, it gives you the option to do so, so I don't consider it unfair. But not before I partake in a healing rabbit orgy and kill a bunch of priests. I give myself the best armor I can find and then I take it out on this dickhead. Pun partially intended. There's a skill point system in the game where you can learn new abilities. I learn loving whispers because John Hammer is both lover and fighter. Usually I don't go for spells with characters like this in other games, but it felt a little necessary here. You don't have mana or focus or anything like that, and instead you cast spells using your sanity, which is pretty cool. It's also great to get something like loving whispers as it's a super strong healing spell in a game that does not have a lot of healing stuff going on. Granted, there's not a tremendous amount of mind restoration either. This is one of the areas where the game game takes a lot of inspiration from other survival horror games in that department. Both your brain and your body are almost constantly deteriorating and you do not have an infinite supply of things to prevent that. God, I'm getting way too coherent about game mechanics. It feels unnatural. Back to the stream of consciousness shit. I meet a dog and I feed it until it becomes my dog. Now it eats people for me. It turns out I was right about John Hammer's magic phobia being more of an intolerance than a fear because the first encounter we have with a mage, he immediately hits a 1200 damage crit. We then find our final party member for now, who has been assaulted by a bunch of cave dwellers because of course she has. Thank God for bleak games, am I right? We then murder an entire cave dweller society, which goes surprisingly well. I end up finding an enormous creature that's sleeping. Mayhaps this is the Lovecraftian influence people were talking about? Big old ancient snoozer god? That'll do it. If you ignore the sex aspects of the game, because H.P. Lovecraft was one of the most sexless creatures ever to live, but we'll talk more about that later. The game is substantially more palatable when you've got a full party, albeit more party members does mean more responsibility because you're the only person who can look after anyone, apparently. At least Moonless gets on with things. We like Moonless. Moonless pisses literally everywhere and grows stronger each time. Why does everyone look old? This game teaches us the important fact that if you're losing your mind, you can always turn to opium. Then you can cast spells again. Pyramid bird fucking bites off the head of my friend. What the fuck, man? She needed that. Then another bird thing bites off John Hammer's arm. What the fuck, man? He didn't necessarily need that, but good heavens, that's just rude. He has to use a slightly smaller sword now. Real funny. You got the whole squad laughing. I end up finding a giant lizard fish and killing it in what is ultimately a very successful boss fight. Then some horn bastard kills my dog and in a state of pure mourning, John and Darcy have sex in a dungeon room. And naturally, because sex is a sinful act that only the worst of us commit, we turn into a horrible flesh creature called Johncy. I reload a save. I end up finding the guy that I came here for and for some reason that really upsets everyone in the party. Darcy considers giving up. I give her drugs and alcohol and she's chipper again. A tale as old as time. Now, I've done what I came here for. Bad man that killed my folks is dead. We can leave. Or we could delve deeper into the dungeons. Beyond the confines of man-made walls where the madness truly resides. Where this grim dark world takes on an even more sinister tone. Where eldritch beasts and horrors live. If living is even the right name for that. Where nothing is sacred and no one comes back the same as they left. If at all. Nah. 
I just had a thought about the more brutal mechanics of the game, like the limb losses and the various crippling status effects. If they weren't so brutal individually, the game would be more brutal as a whole. Bear with me. You're given the option to carry on whenever something awful happens to you, and you can do that, absolutely. But you'll die, almost certainly. It's bleak and hopeless and thematically quite cool. But if the rest of the game wasn't so much of a one bad hit and everything's fucked type scenario, we'd be much more likely to carry on with these awful status effects. They become much more of a mechanic rather than just a cruel punishment for what is mostly bad RNG. And there is so much RNG. I know people like that kind of thing, but I'm not big on it. I understand the value of things like risk mitigation, that can be fun, but when half of your party members miss their very important attacks each combat, with such brutal punishments for that kind of thing coming very regularly, it does start to irritate. Plus, if the game was slightly more forgiving, it wouldn't be 90% walking around. That's something I haven't really mentioned, because a tremendous amount of horror games do the exact same thing. But when you fail the coin flip to save the game so many times that it runs out of enemies to spawn for you, and you just have to slowly walk out of a room and then come back again just to fail one more time, it's just boring, not brutal. This is where I think my opinion on the game is going to deviate from a lot of other people's. Usually, I love it when a game has its mechanics match up to its themes. It's rare to find games that do this well. Fear and Hunger does manage to do this. The mechanics are as bleak as the world it takes place in. But unfortunately, one of the main themes of Fear and Hunger is futility. And the way that is tied to mechanics is through a huge selection of things that are designed purely to waste your time. It's not even padding, it's a very straightforward disrespect for your time. It so badly wants you to know how futile everything you're doing is. And listen, I appreciate that from an artistic standpoint, but holy shit, I've got things to do in my life, man. In the time it takes me to simply save the game, I could do so much. I could have tidied my kitchen, sent some emails, written more for the script, but no, I couldn't because the game demands that time from you to do the most basic of things. I think it's fine, even good, for games to have unpleasant or player-hostile aspects, but when they come at the expense of the rest of the game, breaking up the pacing, ruining the atmosphere, tiring out the visuals, making me listen to the same 15 seconds of a room's soundtrack every time I have to come back and forth just to pay the Funger coin flip tax, it's no longer fine. And it's definitely not good. But now we get to go deeper down into the dungeons and... Hell yeah, brother, this is what I'm talking about. Weird underground cities, ominous green devices that turn cubes into dreams, beacons that you can light for some purpose, perhaps. This is where it starts to feel a little more Lovecraftian. Until it crashes and I have to do it all again. I don't know if that's my recording software that causes the game to melt down or what, because it's happened a few times, but it's not ideal. Who knows, maybe this is an intended mechanic. It would certainly fit well with the rest. We end up finding someone in the city, and we help them back to the entrance of the dungeons. We then have to walk all the way back into the underground city. I could have seen that coming, but I'm still pissed. Almost every time I've helped someone, it's been to the detriment of me. Eventually, I find an enormous tower with a safe bed in it. Good heavens, a guaranteed safe spot with no coin flips involved. How kind. Unfortunately, the monkey's paw curls and puts it at the top of a long spiral staircase, which is not the most fun thing to navigate in RPG Maker. Now you may remember that earlier on John Hammer got a parasite, and you may remember that I cured it. Well, I died after that, and when I reloaded, the parasite cure was gone. John Hammer has had a tapeworm for the entirety of the game, from literally the first combat encounter. In the wretched ancient city, I find some worm juice, and finally, I'm free of it. I genuinely gasped when this happened. He was eating so much food. Exploring this area is probably the most fun I've had in the game. The enemies are seemingly less horrible to fight, and the exploration has been much more rewarding. I even decided to save my game following an unfortunate fight where I lost Moonless. Rest in peace, my lovely piss creature. At least Moonless died fighting some kind of unholy blend of man and wolf. The enemies here are also much less... How do I put this delicately? Edgy. They're much more visually frightening and substantially less hung. There were some parts here that genuinely creeped me out, too. Finding this guy on a wall that I could poke was distressing. Not because he did anything, but because the path he is in front of is a dead end. He may have been dormant when I first went by, but... The second time? Yeah, he's still dormant, but the atmosphere put me on edge. I find a really grim book that talks about how the gods do shit with bodies, and honestly, in writing alone, it's great. It's not exactly explicit, but it's definitely not vague as to what it's implying either. This is the kind of weird sex cult danger that I was expecting, not the shock value stuff from earlier in the game. Also, John Hammer finally got his hands on a big spear. Fuck yes. I mean, as in the, the, the weapon. The pointed stab device. 
the things that the Romans like to put everywhere. The, this, the strong against cavalry things, not... Good save. I eventually get brave enough to venture into the green realm and... The, uh, fuck, what? Yeah, stop it. This place is awesome. It's horrible. And vice versa. I get the option to put Darcy on some meat hooks and decide against it. She's had a rough week. The restraint shown by the dev in this area is admirable too. The fucking mannequin room is horrible and any other dev would have absolutely used it to startle a player, but not here. You're just left in a state of suspense. It's genuinely unsettling. Where was that restraint before? Another reason I like this section of the game a lot more is because, for whatever reason, I got substantially luckier with my coin flips. Turns out when the pacing of a game isn't shattered with gameplay bureaucracy, it becomes substantially more engaging. Look at this creepy fucker, patting you and smiling at you. Fuck him. He's got an insta-kill ability that then depicts you being sexually assaulted afterwards. God damn it, things were going so well. Overall, the green realm sections are very cool. They subtly change some of the world layout, putting roads where there would otherwise be chasms and whatnot. There are also different enemies in there, like ah and ooh and ee. Tentacle man spotted. Lovecraftian game confirmed. This place seems nice. Let's pray. Oh. You get ominous vibes from them. Is that so? I meet some new gods and they give me three questions. I ask about the city we're in and they say, It's weird, huh? I ask about fear and hunger and they say, What's that? I ask about enlightenment and they say, What's that? I leave the space and return to the Temple of Enlightenment. Not sure I trust these new gods with the day-to-day -day handling of existence. I imagine this is a big lore place where you can learn a lot more about the world, and this is very cool and unique. I like it a lot. Can I ask why everything wants to fuck everything else? This guy looks like he knows. Never mind. He one-shot me. I like this guy's face. It gives me a real I have no mouth and I must scream vibe. Girl loses an arm, but does so well at spells and such that I treat her to some opium and she forgets all about it. I realize that for one of the game's puzzles, I need to sacrifice a party member. Well, it can't be girl, and I don't really want to kill Darcy. So... Ah, fuck. A shady guy sold me some maps, and um... Yeah, I got scammed. Looking around some more, I find a head man. He says, <laughs> and combat starts. At this point, I've stopped questioning things. I tried to find a third, adult, human party member in the early stages of the game, and in my exploration, I find myself encountering ghost enemies who can only be damaged by magic three games in a row. Naturally, I don't have any offensive magic because I'm not a coward, so I go and curse Darcy's weapon, but it doesn't automatically re-equip, so we die. Then I do it again and make sure it's equipped. It doesn't do enough damage, and we die. I then go to curse two weapons, one for Darcy and one for John. John's sword shatters when cursing it. Fuck everything about this process. Then I go and try again, and it finally works. So I go to save the game so I don't have to do it all another time, and I fail the save flip in two separate areas, both of which have been completely cleared of enemies. You awake to a strong sense of killing intent. Yes, and I think I will for some time. I try again. I approach the ghost. John Hammer misses his first attack. His second attack hits for zero damage. I don't know why. I've equipped the magic weapon. John's arm gets cut off and I stopped playing for the day. Granted, at least one of those deaths was my fault. I didn't double check that I'd re-equipped the weapon, but everything else surrounding that was just tedious. I can fully see why people like this game. The world is interesting, the lore is intriguing. When things are good, it's a really hard game to put down, but it's actively designed to not be good, like 80% of the time. I've never experienced a game that wants to be played less than this. I can already hear some of the comments for this video. YouTuber hates game because it's not easy. The snowflakes are ruining gaming. But A, what? And B, hear me out. I came in expecting a game that would feel like pulling teeth because that's what the reputation promised. What I got was a game that sometimes teases your teeth in an alluring way and just spends the rest of the time being inconvenient. I was expecting to feel upset or defeated, but that's not what I feel at all. In fact, I've got a list of things that give me the exact same emotion as this game. A child kicking the back of your seat on an airplane. Someone eating nachos very loudly during a dramatic scene in a cinema. Opting out of every individual cookie on a website but having it inexplicably refresh just before you submit your preferences so you have to start again, and resetting your password for a website, and for whatever reason, having that password not work. The cinema one is probably the most apt here because there are such good moments in this game, and they are consistently dragged down by all of the intentional bullshit. Anyway, 
I find another party member. It's the dickhead that stole from me earlier. He's my friend now. Until a ghost hits me through a guard with an attack that does 11 damage, yet somehow causes me to have a heart attack and instantly die. I lost a lot of progress having that happen. John Hammer starts eating people out of spite. Oh dear, Kahara has necrophobia. Just kidding, I don't kill him immediately. First, we enter some kind of dream world inside the green realm, and all of a sudden, I'm worried we're in way too deep, because we're now in London. Sorry. Rundon. Oh shit, it's John Hammer. And his Nan. I can see where he gets his... qualities. A mystery woman tells us that our friend girl is important and she needs to be taken to the heart of darkness. I think she's already there, to be fair. After a short four failed save attempts in a row, we're ready to sacrifice little old Kahara. Sorry, pal. Gingers only. This big wheel fella does not take too kindly to that, and John Hammer misses five attacks in a row against him. Then I realize what actually needs to happen in the fight, and I win a Pyrrhic victory after using almost all of my resources. That one's on me. Holy fuck, where is he? I, I knew it. The bastard takes one of John Hammer's arms. It took away the one thing he cared about, his big spear. I need to do the boss fight again if I want it back. Ugh. This time, John Hammer lands a 4,000 damage fucking crit on the boss and damn near one-shots him. Good on ya, you fucking unit. I pay for this transgression by having another seven failed save attempts in a row. I stopped recording after three because I had a feeling I'd be here for a while, but I did not expect it to go on for that long. Trust me, it did. Now this brings me on to the topic of coin flips. It's allegedly a 50-50 chance. Bullshit. The odds of me failing seven times in a row, picking the same option every time, are ludicrously low. We calculate that by doing 1 half or 0.5 to the power of 7 and multiplying by 100. If there is a 50% chance of succeeding each time, that means that those consecutive failures had a 0.78% chance of happening. Earlier, I had it happen four times in a row. That's a much more reasonable 6.25% chance. But in my first playthrough, when I was doing some initial testing back in November, I had it fail, I shit you not. 14 times in a row. That is a 0.006% chance. Roughly speaking, those are 1 in 16.6 thousand odds. In the USA, the likelihood of being struck by lightning in your lifetime is 1 in 15.3 thousand. Granted, that 14 failures in a row is pretty spectacular, even if the chance is really as low as a 25%, let's say. But still, do not lie to me and say it's 50-50. And you know what really stings? Sometimes when you eventually succeed on one, doing a search for items, you get nothing anyway. Ugh, oh, carrying on. I find a room full of braziers, and when I light them all, the game slows to an absolute crawl. I do not know why. Must be the Ultra 4K RTX enabled flames. Naturally, these lead to the greatest enemy we've fought yet. It's not the old gods, new gods, or even someone from Britain. It's a Frenchman. Feeling that his throne may lead to an ending, I go back and save again. A quick 3.125% chance later, I head back and burn to death because the flames were glitched. Great. I come back and take a seat on my rightful throne. This is not an ending. We're in the real green realm now, and it's creepy as shit. I kind of like it. I feel like I need to hide in these holes and I'm too afraid to stick my neck out and see why. After figuring out the puzzling layout of this enormous space, I find a guy and he throws some hypothetical scenarios at me. I turn into a god and die in obscurity. The end. I unlock a dating sim mode, as is tradition. I'm going to do a different end, I think. D and E don't seem like they're the good ones. This must be the good ending. Bug ending. I'll be honest, I used an exploit to access more endings. Turns out I had accidentally locked myself out of two of them through RNG alone, because I'd used the only guaranteed explosive vial in one place rather than another. So I used an exploit to give myself more. That also broke a lot of the game's logic, and it now thinks that I'm another character, and several of the areas have mysteriously changed, and I don't produce any natural light myself. It's kind of cool, actually. Hey, listen, I just wanted to experience more of the game so I could give it more of a fair evaluation. It was also kind of bullshit that two of the game's endings are hidden behind a very mundane yet obscure thing that itself has no narrative importance. Girl ends up losing her other arm, and she's running low on opium. I believe the technical term for her situation is... bad. Then I get cut in half by some blades. Guess Girl's getting her arm back. I almost felt guilty using an exploit, and then I progressed further through the gauntlet area. Now I have no guilt. Fuck that place, that's all I'll say. I beat the final boss and win. Well, win. 
Turns out ending A was the worst of all of them. I usher in an age of suffering and it turns out that my friend Girl was the god of everything shit. Great, glad I spent a couple extra hours finding this. Good lord. I have incredibly mixed feelings about this game, as you can definitely tell. On one hand, there's an incredibly alluring setting with enough in the way of lore trailheads, environmental storytelling, wonderfully grim character design, and excellent visual stylings, with a clearly very strong developer behind it who has an incredibly rare talent for ludonarrative synthesis. Yes, I said ludonarrative. I've read enough Twitter arguments in my time. But then there's the tasteless sexual assault, the self-destructive punishment mechanics, which are not only overly abundant, but also cruel past the point of being interesting, huge amounts of random chance, and strange hurdles that the player has to navigate without being told that they exist. For example, this game does the same thing that Deus Ex Human Revolution did in its opening mission, which is annoying as fuck. From the minute you start the game, you're put on a timer. There's no indication of this. At least in Deus Ex, it's heavily implied. At least in Deus Ex, it doesn't permanently lock you out of two of the game's other endings. Yeah, that's a real fucking thing this game does too. And I only found out once I beat it and started doing some research. So, if you're keeping track, that means there are two endings hidden behind an invisible timer that you're never told about, and another two hidden behind a consumable item which has no narrative importance. Some games are better than the sum of their parts. For example, Elden Ring, like I mentioned earlier. There are quite a few problems with Elden Ring, but as a whole experience, it's good. Feared Hunger is the opposite. It's one of the only games I've ever touched that would exclusively benefit from entire sections and mechanics being cut. I'm sure people will disagree with me. I mean, the overwhelming sentiment surrounding this game is positive. But do people think that the coin flip lottery to save the game, the explicit shows of sexual assault, and the blatant disrespect for its own pacing, let alone your time, are what make it good? I genuinely think this had the potential to be one of my favorite games. Not just favorite horror or RPG maker games, but overall. It was one of the many entries in the post-Dark Souls world of difficult and bleak video games, but it's one of the rare examples that had soul. It had the intrigue, it had the atmosphere, it had the story, the world, the concept, all perfectly done. But somewhere along the way it got mixed up. It mistook nihilism for sadism. It mistook being bleak for being hostile. And it mistook challenge as cruelty. Now when people talk about good Lovecraftian games, they'll sometimes bring this up, and I can definitely see why. It's got the classic story of someone delving deep into the earth, finding ancient civilizations and eldritch sites, you've got the religious commentary, the madness, the xenophobia, there's even a healthy dose of tentacles. But it gets humans wrong. When I made this video, good lord, almost six years ago, I didn't discuss this part of Lovecraft's work because I didn't really clock it at the time. People often mischaracterize Lovecraftian horror as being inhuman, but maybe the most important aspect of his writing specifically is the humanity and how it's treated. That may sound odd to some of you, but keep in mind that there's quite a substantial gulf between parts of Lovecraftian horror and cosmic horror as a whole, despite the large overlap elsewhere. You need to have that intense fear, that confusion, that transformation, pain, inquisition, whatever it may be that defines a character's motivation, and you need to have it not matter. We need to be able to empathize with someone's situation. Almost all of Lovecraft's work is written in a very personal way, even if what he's describing is beyond comprehension. But that empathy needs to be in contrast to the world's, the universe's apathy. That doesn't happen in Fear and Hunger. Our human experience is what allows us to convene with gods, fight gods, become gods ourselves. We as lowly people can change the course of history in this world. We may be ants to the gods in Fear and Hunger, but we needed to be atoms, because ants can still bite. Is it cosmic horror? Absolutely. But not Lovecraftian. Six years later, and in my mind, Stalker's still on top. In talking to people who like this game, I've aired some of my complaints about it, and everyone, everyone has said the same thing. Oh, Fear and Hunger 2 Termina is better about that kind of thing. So who knows? Maybe that one will be what I was looking for. But for now, that's everything from me. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to see more from me, you can catch me on Twitch a few times every week at twitch.tv forward slash paintskiss, and you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash paintskiss like these fine people have. Special thanks to those at the $10 tier, Untrusted Life, and the original Tex-Mex. All of my links are in the description, including the Stream Archive channel, my Discord, the link to Zuldim's excellent video. I haven't watched the part on Termina yet because I wanted to avoid spoilers, but I'll get to that when I play it myself. I'll see you all soon in my next video where I'll cover something somewhat related to this one. But for now, that's everything from me. And seeing as I didn't find a good cowboy way of saying goodbye in my Blood West video, here's one I got from the comments. Happy trails, partner.